Hello everyone. So welcome to the um, Utopia and Desire through sci-fi class. This is going to be our first class. Um, it's all a bit weird. I was kind of hoping that by January we'll be able to do in-person teaching, um, but obviously it hasn't happened. So bear with me while I figure all of this technological stuff out. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I am Elizabeth. Um, we'll be doing the lectures on this on Twitch, so you can um, watch them um, here, and they're going to be recorded and uploaded, kind of like what Matt is doing in the um, Plato and Deleuze class. I'm not really sure if I'm going to upload them to YouTube just yet, but they should be available on, on this channel. Um, we're going to be doing the seminars over Zoom, um, so after the first hour-ish, hour we're going to have a break. Um, and then we're gonna all reconvene on Zoom. So I'm hoping to actually be able to see your faces there. <laughs> um, okay, uh, let me just get my notes. I, I, this is so confusing. I really, I really miss seeing you all and being in the um, bin depot. Okay, so my notes. First of all, we're gonna start with um, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm gonna explain a little bit about the classes, what I, uh, wanted to do um, what hopefully we're going to be doing together um, and um, a little bit about how the Free University of Brighton functions in case you haven't been to any of our classes before. Uh, so my so this class is called Utopian Desire Through Sci-Fi and I um, wanted to teach it mostly because I uh, like sci-fi. Uh, I wanted to share some of that passion with you guys. Um, I also thought it would be a great excuse to read more sci-fi. Um, so, um, and I've actually managed to do that. I've read a few really interesting things. Um, the the um, desire bit comes um, from the from my own background in philosophy, which um, some of you may know is um, on Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari um, and their collective work. Um, and um, kind of new materialist, post-humanist studies. So we're going to be um, looking at the concept of desire um, um, through kind of a delusion lens, but I'll explain that in the class. Um, at first, I was um, a little bit unsure about the class because I am not really, I never really liked um, kind of the ways that academia studies utopia. And I always felt like the relationship between utopia and politics is um, there's tension in there that I didn't like. Um, so I'm hoping that actually in this class we're going to be discussing this and um, addressing some of that tension. Um, and what was it the second thing I wanted to say? I, I don't know. Um, oh yes, um, and I just um, was hoping that um, kind of. Um, we're going to be able to expand a little bit on um, different things that we've studied before. So if you've been to my classes before, um, you will maybe be able to recognize some of these things. Or if you've been to the uh, research seminars that me and Charlie did last year, you might also recognize some of the stuff that we had there in, <clears throat> in this class. So the class is not going to be particularly kind of introductory. Um, and hopefully um, you will be familiar with some of the terms. I'm not going to be um, kind of explaining a lot of concepts from um, like it, it kind of entirely. So I'm going to be assuming some kind of knowledge in philosophy. Um, I'm hoping that that's going to be okay. If you don't understand anything, make a note, um, either put it in the chat or we can discuss it in the seminar or ask me on River and I can uh, try to provide more information. Um, so the classes are going to be on Wednesday evenings. Um, the seminars um, are going to be on Zoom from eight until nine. Um, I think the link I've posted the link already. I think you can reuse the same link every week, but I'm going to check if that's the case. If not, just go on River and, and find the link. Um, and I posted a, a document earlier, but I don't know if you've seen it, so I'm just going to um, go through it. Um, about what we're going to do in the class, um, and um, so the class is not <clears throat> sorry. Um, the class is not going to be um, 
kind of uh, I don't know if I can say that word li literary uh, studies is going to be more philosophy but we are going to be looking at sci-fi in particular and that's going to pose some limitations on how we understand the concept of utopia um, and um, the kind of whole field of utopian studies is um, it's quite in interdisciplinary um, so it's it's um, quite often connected to literature, history, or philosophy, but also things like sociology and politics and religion. And we're going to discuss how this is going to affect our understanding of, of utopia. Um, and and like so, what we're going to try to do is focus particularly on sci-fi um, and on uh, the um, the way um, um, utopian fiction functions um, or like portrays the role of politics. Um, and some of the questions that we might be looking at uh, would be questions around collective consciousness, prefiguration, um, clicking noise, um, I don't know what that would be, maybe from the window, I hope it goes. Um, so some of the questions we're going to be looking at are questions about collective consciousness, prefiguration, the role of imagination, also the role of uh, production. Um, we might be thinking about how utopian fantasies interact with reality, uh, what's the function of utopian thinking, um, how does it relate to real politics, um, can utopias help bring about social change, or can they, what's their function in relation to social change, um, where does utopian thinking start and when does it end, so what do we classify as utopia, um, do, do novels, do utopian thinking, does it change the world? And we're also going to be thinking a little bit about the relationship between utopian sci-fi and dystopian power structures. Okay, so uh, what we're going to be doing in the class is reading some um, sci-fi stories. And I posted them about a month ago. I hope you've all seen them. Uh, Karen has very, very nicely found us audiobooks or audio versions of most of them. So you don't even have to read them. You can just uh, put them on your headphones and go out for your daily walk and you finish them in no time. Um, we are also going to be reading some philosophy, which I haven't posted yet, reading or listening, um, mostly because, um, yeah, I'll, I'll post it this week, um, mostly because I haven't really been sure how to um, how to put them in, in the dialogue, but um, we'll see. Um, but the main themes that we're going to be exploring are going to be themes around um, gender, sexuality, class inequality, community, technology, the environment, um, and um, um, did I say technology? Technology. Um, and these are, um, I suppose, kind of often social problems um, that when um, taken into all social problems that exist in, in real life, uh, which then are um, used as the kind of springboard to create uh, or like that, the solution to these problems is used as springboard to create um, utopia sci-fi. So hopefully we'll be able to trace that a little bit, and then uh, we'll be looking at um, various concepts and philosophy, mostly from what I said already, Deleuze and Guattari, and uh, post-trans and ahumanist thinkers. So we might be looking at. Um, Jasper Poir, Donna Haraway, Rosie Bradotti, Patricia McCormack, who came to um, to the university last year to give a seminar, um, and um, potentially various others. Um, so this should probably be obvious by now. <laughs> the first uh, hour of the class is going to be a lecture, um, and it's going to be streamed here. The second hour of the class is going to be like a seminar, um, and there's going to be a little break in the middle. Um, in the lectures, it's going to be mostly me talking, um, unless you talk in the chat, in which case I will respond. Um, if you have any um, questions um, that kind of need to be immediately addressed, put them in the chat. If you don't, then um, keep them for the seminar. So if you have like kind of bigger discussion questions, put them in the seminar. Um, in the seminar, I'm hoping that you're going to be leading the conversation by talking about the things that you found interesting in the books and um, the problems that you want to um, address. Um, and on that note, I highly recommend uh, you doing the reading to prepare for the classes. Um, even if you don't do the philosophy, um, just doing the um, 
the sci-fi uh, would, be, would be massively helpful um, for our discussion. Um, feel, free, feel free to bring any materials, so if you have made notes or if you want to bring the book or whatever, you're welcome to. And I um, also encourage you, I know that it's slightly different online, but I also encourage you as usual to try to facilitate a discussion or do a short presentation on something that you're interested in. Um, if that's the case, if you want to do that, then um, ha talk to me on River if you need me, or just you know let me know which topic you're interested in, uh, and we can I can help you with that, or um, I can facilitate you presenting. Um, you can also do assessment for the class. The assessment is optional; you don't have to. Um, if you want to do assessment um, and you're not sure what um, what questions you want to address um, again come and talk to me we can we can discuss questions um, we can see what you're interested in um, or you can just send me the questions that you have in mind and then we can try to f form it into an assessment question um, I would suggest kind of go through a few classes first and um, and see how they're going and then think about what in particular you might be interested in um, writing about if you're not sure um, and the assessment as usual can be an essay, can be a presentation, um, can be a video recording, uh, can be, I don't know, a, a, you can act out a play if you want to, um, it might be a bit hard on Zoom, but you know, you get my feeling. Um, there is um, a description of kind of what I would expect from the different types of assessment, so if it's an essay, there's a minimum number of words. If there is a, it's an oral presentation, there's a minimum number of, or the, um, minimum number of minutes. So just have a look at that, and then we can discuss it. Okay, housekeeping done. So now on actual utopia and desire. Um, where do we start? Um, so the first I thought, well, it's a classic kind of philosophical move. Um, first, I thought we can um, we're going to start with trying to um, understand. Oh, oh, I missed my slide. Oh, rubbish. Okay, these are the different topics in the different books. That's just taken from River. So if you're not sure um, where to um, to find them, it's on River. It's under uh, under topics in the class forum. So that's, that's just the books that we're going to be reading and the topics that it is broadly separated on. Aha, uh -huh, there we go, that's the slide I wanted. So, um, how do we define utopia? Um, in, a, in a classic philosophical move, we're going to start by trying to, to define the terms that we are going to be using. Um, and um, utopia, I think it's a quite um, interesting one to to try to, to define because um, when it was um, coined by Thomas More, it already was coined with like ambig ambiguity and, and a little bit of a pun. Um, so etymologically, it comes from the Greek, um, I, can't, I don't know how to pronounce the difference, but OU and plus topos, which means no place. But he also specifically um, mentions in in his book that it's also very, the word utopia is also very close to EU plus topos, which means a good place. Um, so this this kind of um, distinction is already, um, contains this pun and contains this ambiguity, um, which makes it um, a little bit hard when you, when you try to um, understand what it refers to. Um, and we're gonna see later, I made a little, or I tried to make a little silly timeline um, of utopias, um, but how um, we're going to see later how kind of that meaning has carried carried on, and um, and even now when we talk about utopias, we colloquially, um, you know, almost it's, it's almost like always implied that it's something that's a little bit unrealistic. It's a little bit naive. Um, it's like a fantasy. It's not really um, something that um, you know that can that can happen. That's possible. Um, and then um, this kind of idea of, or like this kind of um, idea of it being something um, like an impossible dream is um, also something that um, is going to have a big impact on how we understand utopias in relation to politics. So it's good to kind of keep that in mind. 
um, and I wanted to start with this but I also um, wanted to um, say that um, you know we can we can try to think about how we want to define it in the class and I think that's um, something we should try to do in the seminar um, but um, I suppose one kind of common feature of utopia is that um, is found through um, since kind of it you know it started it, the term was coined um, is that it contains some kind of um, description or some kind of information uh, about a world that we could live in if we you know if we if we if it was possible um, so it's always the, the idea of utopia is always related to what the good life is or what the good life could be um, and we're going to be trying to um, understand this relationship between utopia and ethics and the good life um, in in various ways but it's not it's not necessarily just kind of um, like a um, a, a dream uh, but maybe um, something a little bit more than um, just kind of like um, a fantasy but again we'll be going to be trying to address this um, and in and in that relation um, and in trying to kind of define um, what utopia is we might want to also think about um, things like or um, or works um, no, they're not works. What are they? Uh, we might also want to think about um, religion and um, and um, paradise or heaven. Um, is there? Do we do we include religious visions as part of what utopias are, um, or is this or are utopias something that are um, something that is always political in some sense? Um, is it something that kind of has to? have some kind of potential to happen before we die or you know could it be um you know when 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 can utopia happen um and um and and kind of like i i know again that is a bit silly but you know we we might want to think about what definition we want to be particularly using in in this class um and think about how um you know, what would be the most helpful definition for us? How can we understand utopia in the most helpful way? Um, and I, I just kind of wanted to, to put, put it out there that you know definitions um, are not something that's kind of set in stone and, and then in itself definitions are the tools that we use to understand um, concepts. Um, and so, so if we, so I think it would be a good exercise for us in the seminar to try to unpick um, what we think utopia is together um, and I'm hoping that you're making some um, notes in paper or in your mind already about what you think it is. Um, also one of the main things that um, utopian studies uh, want to, I don't know why I did quotation marks on this, there is a thing in academia which is called utopian studies. Um, uh, one of the main ways in which utopian studies um, kind of try to categorize or, or understand them um, ut utopian fiction utopias um, is um, through kind of three different um, aspects of utopias so the first one is um, through the um, through the content um, and um, the there is kind of a common assumption uh, that um, a utopia is a portrayal of good society. Um, for most people, utopia would contain s at least kind of some sort of description of a good society. Um, and um, what's interesting there is how it brings up questions such as um, kind of what is good and what we value. Um, so, for instance, um, I don't know um, <laughs> when when utopian um, fiction. Um, was present in the 40s there was fascist utopias and there were um, um, totalitarian utopias so we might want to think about um, kind of what does it say about what we value if we um, no sorry what yes what does it say that we value if our idea of utopia is a totalitarian state um, and of course that also brings up questions of um, kind of utopias um, um, being socially not sorry but yeah utopian thinking utopian notions being socially constructed um so we're going to be um something that i think 
is interesting when you look at the content of like what is actually what what are the things that we value that we've put in that in that utopia um is um um are, are these things are things that um don't just come out of out of thin air they're things that are socially constructed through like our or the author's everyday experience maybe imagination uh thinking etc etc um and often these descriptions again when we talk about content often these descriptions of the good society have something to do with um um or or, or are seen as something quite idealistic um something that is maybe like unreal too naive too good to happen um and um and the other and the kind of other aspect that i wanted to bring um bring out in relation to um to this um idea that think that utopias are unrealistic is that um notions of what's realistic and what's unrealistic are also socially constructed um and um and the the kind of whole idea of utopias being um too good or unrealistic um inherently implies that unrealistic images of the of the good society are somehow less worthy of of consideration they're like less worthy of thinking um and i think that's that's quite interesting when it when we look at um particularly um utopian writing um and utopian sci-fi writing which is often dismissed as um like maybe um not not sufficiently rigorous <clears throat> sorry not sufficiently um um kind of academic there is like you know the sci-fi not academic maybe was not the right word but there is like the sci-fi utopias and there is the political utopia so you know thomas more is um is seen as a political utopia as is seen as like a uh unimportant um seminal text in in political studies whilst maybe um some of the works that we're going to look at um are you know not not seen as equally important um so the second the second way of defining um utopias is um through the form um and we um that's that's an interesting one for us as well because we're going to be looking at utopias mostly in literature but of course they are not limited to literature um in utopian studies there is often um like one of the kind of big um a big part of utopian studies is um studying uh i've forgotten the term now i think communal com com communitarian communal yeah some things uh some kind of com uh, <laughs> utopian communities that exist or like have existed in real life um so they are mostly focused on um i guess communes in the us um and um israel um and the kibbutz um, system in israel as kind of examples of utopian um communities or like utopian utopias in, in life um we're going to be um looking at utopias as a lit literary i can't say that word probably literary genre um because we're obviously focusing on sci-fi um there isn't any kind of particularly um like special reason for this apart from um i was interested in sci-fi and wasn't that interested in um other aspects of utopia um but we i think what would be kind of important to um remember also potentially in some of the stuff that we read is that um some utopian um f some people who write in utopian studies um are um might um might take utopia as a literary genre um whilst also or, or like by doing that they might try to take away the political aspects of of utopian sci-fi um and that's um you know that's just kind of like present in in some um in in some fields of academia but um the idea that the having um 
if it's if it's a work of fiction then it doesn't really have any political implications or like um, philosophical implications so we're not going to do that but that is a possible kind of approach to understanding utopias um, and then the last one is um, function um, and I find that one of the most contentious elements of utopian studies um, and it's kind of basically asking the question well what is it for um, and um, and I think that's um, that's kind of the, the the question that we're going to be addressing a lot in in the class. Um, I come from having spoken to some of you. I feel like you're already um, thinking about that. Um, and it's I guess it's kind of the question that is being also most commonly um, asked about utopias and utopian writing. And I've brought us a quote here, which is quite often. Um, cite it um, when when um, people talk about the political functions of utopias and what utopias do and I'm going to read it out loud a map of the world that does not include utopia is not even worth glancing at for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing and when humanity lands there it looks out and seeing a better country sets sail progress is the realization of utopias um, and that is i think a good example of the kind of questions that often are asked in relation to utopian writing so does it does it present some kind of goal um, does it present a description of society that we should be aiming for um, is it <clears throat> sorry let me just have some water Um, is it necessary to have a description of the good society in order to achieve that good society? Um, and here I was kind of thinking that we can maybe um, um, maybe discuss questions of whether utopias are or utopian writing is somehow um, necessary or sufficient condition for social change. So that's one of I think it's not exactly a phrase like this, but it's one of the questions that I put in the module description um, and um, I was I'm, I'm thinking you probably remember this from other philosophy classes uh, but a necessary um, and sufficient condition is um, a term that is used in formal logic or just logic uh, which means uh, which refers to um, kind of a certain condition has to be met for something to be true um, so, for instance, something like um, humans need oxygen, so oxygen is a necessary condition for human life. I mean, without it, we'll die. Um, and similarly, for um, in case of utopias, so I think it would go something like um, if we or if we want to achieve a better society, then we need utopias, which would be a description of a better society. Maybe. Um, and that is another question that I was hoping we can address today, oh, sorry, at the seminar. Um, and, and in relation to that, um, I think it's quite interesting also to have a look at the relationship between utopias and dystopias, and how um, um, how the it's kind of changed. So I think it used to be um, like quite often seen as dystopia being the opposite of utopias um, but in in res recent years it's um, it's they've kind of blended in in various ways um, so it's it's almost become the case that you can't really have um, like utopias that don't have dystopian elements um, and I think that's going to be um, quite obvious in the works that we study um, but it's um, just something I thought is good to mention. Um, and in relation to this uh, question about utopias and social change, um, I am meant to post this, but I forgot. Um, uh, one interesting argument is um, from um, a guy called Tom Moylan, who um, 
I published a book called Demand the Impossible. Um, and it's actually quite interesting because he focuses on um, two of the novels, I think, that we're going to focus on. So he's he focuses on, or he's um, analysing Ursula Le Guin and Marge Piercy um, and um, a few other ones. Um, and he's um, he, he kind of calls the utopias, or the sci-fi utopias that came out um, from the 70s onwards, um, critical utopias. Um, and um, and he claims that they differ quite, um, they, uh, they're quite different from um, the utopias that came before them in the sense that they um, um, are, um, th they have a stronger connection between um, social, or there's a stronger connection there between utopias and social change uh, than it was with the previous ones. Um, and I think so part of his argument relies on on this um, um, kind of change between um, how utopia and dystopia used to be seen. So um, he's arguing for the um, um, an, a new way of understanding the dystopian elements in utopia, or then the incorporation of them. Um, and um, so, according to him, the the, the new utopias or these utopias uh, differ both in their content and in the in the in their form, um, so it, it it presents a society in which the utopia, uh, in which there's a kind of a critique. So the utopia is never really just. Um, I, I mean, maybe it would be easier if you if you can com if you've read some of them and you can compare, for instance, Thomas More's Utopia um, and the Dispossessed, which is what we're reading for next week. Um, and the, the Thomas More Utopia is a, it's a real description of this really perfect society. Um, everything is great, everything is amazing. Um, whilst um, in the dispossessed, there is um, quite a lot of difficulties, inconsistencies. Um, things are not really very, th things are not really perfect. Um, there's a lot of, I don't, I don't want to give you spoilers. Maybe, I mean, there will be spoilers. Um, but you, you know, there is, there is a lot of. Um, unpleasant things that happen um, and um, I suppose his argument is that this um, th these kind of critical utopias um, um, appear more realistic I suppose um, and therefore have um, more kind of uh, um, more ability to um, affect or to, to be influential in consciousness raising. Um, and that's something that um, he sees as kind of directly connected to social change. Hmm. I hope I make sense. It's really weird to be talking to yourself. Mm. Um. So what was I? Con oh, yes, consciousness raising. Um, so there's um, there's quite a lot of um, emphasis from um, from various um, utopian scholars on on the idea of consciousness raising um, and particularly in relation to um, this kind of genre or like um, or, or of like these kind of yeah new kind of utopian literature which is the critical um, critical utopias um, and. I think, let me just, aha, there it is. Um, I thought I had it here. So this is the little kind of timeline that I made. Um, and I think it might help us think a little bit um, more clearly about um, um, kind of how, or put it in context. I'm sorry, I'm not making any sense again. I thought it would help us put the works that we are reading and the whole context of utopian studies in relation to kind of the bigger context in the world, um, and 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 then I think it's easier to see the differences between the various types of utopian writing. Um, so starting with Thomas More in in um, the beginning, um, coined the term first kind of description of a geo society. Some people say Plato's Republic is um, the first kind of utopian 
piece of writing. Um, I, I think I would kind of disagree because I don't think um, The Republic is a work of fiction necessarily in the same way that Thomas More's is. Um, but we can also have a discussion about this. Um, and um, so that was around this time and also in the 14th century was um, a bun there was there's a I think it's a poem or a song the land of cocaine that sounds like cocaine I can't read that word I've no idea what they, how to pronounce it um, but um, that was um, uh, it was a kind of an English song or a poem um, that had to do with um, utopian um, society um, and I just thought I'll put it there because it um, it what was what's really interesting about it or actually about both of them is how they're quite um, heavily um, focused on on like being utopias for men. Um, um, in the land of Kogain, like all the women are sexually available, for instance. Uh, and 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 I think yeah, we're going to go back. To, we're going to we're going to come back to that a bit later. Um, and then we skip a few centuries and we get to Mizura, which is the first novel that we're reading, and her land, uh, both quite, um, they're both like feminist utopias, or I guess more like female-led utopias. Um, and um, I think it's quite interesting to think about what else happened in this period in history. So I did not write it down, but I'm going to put this on river so we can kind of all populate um, populated together um, and then um, kind of the, there's there's a, a little bit of like um, I guess dip in utopian writing um, around the Second World War um, people were like there was there was some kind of communist utopian writing um, but also some nationalist or fascist writing um, of, of kind of utopian um, with utopian elements um, and then really we like the golden kind of age of utopian writing starts with the 60s and 70s um, and we have um, all these revolutionary energies um, that are brewing in the world um, so we have um, also Le Guin starts the Hainish cycle uh, which a lot of it contains various kind of utopian elements the dispossessed it that is what we're reading it's in 1974 um, then you know we, we kind of have a bunch of really good stuff in in the 60s 70s and 80s and um, we have the silver metal of a woman in the age of time Lotus brood um and i think it's kind of interesting to think about um the um 60 aged flower power hippies you know all of that that was happening in the world around that time um and how the um the kind of collective imagination was um informing and was being informed by by this utopian, um, uh, by this utopian fiction, um, I've put kind of also philosophically um, some um, works that we're either going to be looking at or um, I think were like related to this um, um, boom of utopias. So we have uh, Herbert Marcuse's *Eros in Civilization* and *Anne's Blocks: The Principle of Hope*. Which are not, they're not um, utopian writings per se, but they both um, kind of address the necessity of utopian thinking in relation to consciousness raising and in relation to um, kind of guiding um, human um, human politics, I guess, or um, or particularly desire but I don't want to really use that word yet and um, then we have anti-Oedipus the same year as the dispossessed that's a great year um, I, I wish I was I was there and uh, the cyborg manifesto by uh, Don Haraway that's in 85 and um, this is something that we're going to be looking at uh, which is kind of um, informing um, all these um, or maybe also being informed by all of these um, ideas of technological development um, and then we have the end of the Soviet Union um, and the um, end of the Cold War, which is um, like is is kind of like arguably um, 
been mm, um, difficult for utopian writing, um, in particular kind of the end of the actual existing socialism um, and the increasing cynicism and disbelief in Marxism. Um, maybe we should put on the timeline. We have you know, Francis Fukuyama announcing the end of history. You know, there's like nothing else that can happen. We've we've done um, everything, and we've decided that capitalism is the best, and like there is no other system. Um, and I guess that was um, kind of where um, um, utopian writing was as well. Um, and I think what's um, interesting is um, to think about um actually utopias pretty much from uh from then onwards being um um very much um kind of left utopias um and obviously there is um a, uh, an argument on, from um left academics or like left philosophers as well that um the um left politics need some kind of utopia need some kind of um, I guess fantasy of the good, of the good place. Um, need some kind of kind of utopian moment um, to to work towards, um, and that's a question that we're gonna um, we should be, or like that that we can also think about when we think about um, uh, utopias and um, and social change. And then we have Oryx and Craig, which we're gonna be reading, and. An unkindness of ghosts, which is very recent. I've just seen the time, and this is um, this is actually terrible because I, I have a lot more of stuff that I want to talk about. Um, okay, so let's just get on with it. Um, the so that's kind of my my presentation about um, utopias and utopian studies, and uh, I wanted to move on to. Um, a little bit more um, towards kind of philosophy and that's um, the code that I've got up now is something that was from your reading um, which was optional for today it's one of Ursula Le Guin's essays um, called uh, Non Euclidean View of California as a Cold Place to Be um, I posted or oh, it's part of the version of Thomas More's Utopia that I put on River um, and the kind of main argument of her short essay there um, is that um, utopias are really only utopias for selected people um, she's talking in particular about settlers in California um, or, or settlers arriving in California seeing seeing the 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 space seeing the territory and thinking you know this is perfect this is utopia this is everything we've dreamt of this all the resources um everything we can possibly want nobody to tell us what to do um but that was a utopia for the settlers for the ind indigenous people who were there um it was actually um possibly a dystopia or the opposite um and um and um the and he, she kind of continues her argument by saying um, utopia um, has has always been quite European, has always been quite masculine, uh, and she kind of talks about how um, she might appear strange or what she does might appear strange because she um, her kind of terms and images are not the masculine images of utopia. Um, and uh, you know these are these are incredible points that I think we should. Um, be thinking about and I think they're going to come up um, particularly in the authors that we're reading because um, so I've selected authors that are either female or genderqueer um, and um, um, and not all of them are white so we, we have um, we're gonna I guess it, be able to make a little bit of comparison between what might a male utopia be and what might other utopias be um, but I just wanted to come um, back on something else that she writes in the essay, which I think is connected to these ideas of utopia and social change. Um, and um, she talks about utopia as the, um, well, I'm going to read out the quote, um, utopia is the application of man's reason and his will to the myth, man's effort to work out imaginatively what happens or might happen when the primal longings embodied in the myth confront the principle of reality. 
In this effort, man no longer merely dreams of a divine state in some remote time. He assumes the role of creator. Um, and she's talking here about how um, utopias were, uh, in particular male utopias like Thomas More's, um, are um, like constructed with this um, logic and reason um, in um, and like constructed in this perfect rational uh, way. Um, and she's saying um, she has kind of a, a bit of a critique of, of this idea of rationality in the essay. Um, but I, th I thought what was in like particularly interesting was that uh, by creating these utopias, uh, the author uh, assumes the role of a creator. And I think that's the kind of connection that we're going to be trying to make in between, um, in between desire and um, and utopias as well. Um, and we're going to be going back to this, so don't be kind of too alarmed if I introduce it a little bit too quickly now. Um, but the um, I, I just wanted to introduce the concept of desire. A little bit and how we're gonna uh, um yeah, let's go back to this um and how how we're gonna be talking about desire in in this class in relation to sci-fi and utopia and i'm gonna <laughs> do that in five minutes which is absolutely impossible but you can ask me more questions in the seminar or next time <clears throat> so um the people that i mentioned previously in the timeline uh, Marcuse and Bloch. Um, they're kind of, um, um, I guess, more uh, traditional Marxists than Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari. Um, and um, a, a, like the way that they fit into utopian thinking is um, through, um, particularly Bloch, through this idea of um, education of desire. Um, so they are both quite concerned about um i suppose desire um in a bit more of a like a psychoanalytic way um and that this and and human desires being directed by the forces of capitalism um towards consumption or towards um um i suppose yeah like through through towards the the, the channels that are um approved by capitalism um and um um, and both of them um, are seeing utopias as a way of liberating that desire or like re-channeling that desire towards some kind of um, more, um, I guess, Marxist or like more productive um, um, ways. Um, and Deleuze and Guattari um, do something slightly different from that. So they're less focused on this um, idea of liberating desire from capitalist repression. Um, and um, they um, take desire, or like the, the starting premise in particular in Antiedipus, and I thought I put a quote here, but I haven't, um, so I'm, I'm not going to show it to you, but I could put it on the river. Um, the, the premise is that um, the um, desire is um, something that is productive. And I think quite a few of you have already are quite familiar with Luce already. Um, so um, hopefully, like my five-minute explanation is going to be enough. But if, um, as I said, we're going to be coming back to this and um, addressing it throughout the entire class, so it's not going to be too. Don't worry too much if you don't get it now. Um, and when Deleuze and Guattari talk about desire, they don't really talk about desire as kind of like uh, something that we we want um, or something that um, um, is. Okay, sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. Why is this? My computer is saying power is off in five minutes. No, I don't want it to be power off. <laughs> oh my god, no, what is happening? Okay. I hope it's fine. If I, uh, I mean, I already have five minutes, so if it cuts off, then it just cuts off. Um,. Where was I? A desire. Okay, so um, they don't really think of desire as something that, like, you know, it's not like I desire to have a biscuit. Um, it's it's more of a kind of um, 
in a, in a more kind of Spinozist way of like a driving force or like a a, a, a canatus, um, something that's like at the core of human being. And desire is productive in the sense that it uh, forces. Uh, there is not an agent that desires something, but the, the agent is produced through desire. Um, and um, it's um, in in kind of in this sense, it goes against psychoanalysis and against like this idea of repressing desire. Um, so they're going um, against Lacan here and against the idea of desire as lack, uh, which would be we desire that which we do not have. Um, and and that desire is kind of regulated um, that and understood through the figure of Oedipus and um, um, and other social formations uh, that kind of mimic that. Um, but they so so they're not really so they're not concerned with desire as something that is um, prohibited or because of that um, desire for them is not something that could be prohibited or repressed. Um, and actors, um, or, or even like kind of possessed in a sense, um, it's just something that is is there. It's like a driving force, and it is productive. Um, so it's um, it's it kind of the the <clears throat> the subject, the human beings, comes through existence, um, comes into existence through desire. Um, and uh, Mars, I don't even know if you're listening, but. I really wish I could do one of your uh, beautiful explanations about the breast and the mouth and the baby, uh, but I'm going to have to save them for next time. We'll just direct people to um, to your recordings. Um, and I, I suppose what I uh, wanted to talk about is that, um, or, sorry, the last thing that I wanted to mention about desire is that desire is... Um, in Deleuze and Guattari is also something that is not just individual, but it is collective. So it's it's social. It forms connections. It forms um, uh, communities. It, it it creates kind of collective experiences. Um, and for um, those of you who listened to Ed's seminar, um, the um, what like what uh, the the really good example or description that he. Um, he was talking about was the um, um, the kind of the idea of the uh, was it, what did he call it? the social ecology? So like there's kind of like um, um, a way in which um, um, the the there is a, I guess like a kind of like a collective psyche he was talking about, um, but um, we we're gonna yeah I guess talk about that more in the next seminar. Um, mm, mm, mm. I think I don't think I can cover um, any more of what I wanted to cover. Uh, and also, it says power off in one minute. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna finish this for now, and I'm gonna sort this out in the break.